Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. I hope you can all hear me uh, well. Um, Thank you very much, Vice-Chancellor, for your kind and generous introduction. And, and thank you all for deciding to come along this evening. Uh, it's a particularly filthy night, and I'm very pleased that so many of you came along. It's lovely to see so many colleagues here, both from the wider university and from my school. And it's particularly lovely to see some of my students here. I'm very pleased to see you. Thank you very much for coming along. I really appreciate it. But before I start, I also have to say a thank you to Katie Warriner from the marketing and comms team. Um, she's been absolutely terrific in helping me to prepare uh, this evening. I'm very, very grateful to her for her help. Um, and I take responsibility for the text, but take, Katie takes the credit for the slides. So thanks, Katie, you've been terrific. I was just saying to uh, Professor Tara Dean, our PVC for Research and Enterprise, it does feel slightly strange to be standing up here delivering an inaugural some six years after first being granted a professorial title and some three and a half years since joining Brighton. But here we are. And I really hope that what I have to say this evening you will find informative, instructive and challenging. The behaviourist psychologist B.F. Skinner claimed that education is what remains when what has learnt has been forgotten. So whilst you may forget the details of what I say, my hope is that you will take away a different perspective on the ethics of research and why it is such an important issue in contemporary academic life. In fact, I would suggest it is more important now than it ever has been. And it's a bold statement, I know, but I will return to it at the end of this lecture. What doesn't seem strange is to be talking to you about the ethics of research. As the Vice-Chancellor stated uh, just in her introduction, human participant research ethics has been an important part of my professional life for over 18 years. Um, for the NHS, the Health Regulation Authority, my professional body, the British Psychological Society, and in both Aberystwyth University and here in Brighton. Engaging with the ethics of research continues to provide opportunities for intellectual debate and the sharing of different perspectives in the governance of research processes with human participants. It can be argued that the process of research is a moral one, aimed as it is at supporting the generation of new knowledge and in so doing, enhancing human experience and the worlds we inhabit. And if conducting research has a moral purpose, I would argue that the process of research has to be supported by a moral framework that guides and enables positive outcomes for participants and societies. The questions that then arise are whose ethics? How do we decide? And who has oversight of the process? If normative ethics is concerned with how human beings should live their lives and what constitutes a good life, it begs the question of how should we conduct research and what does ethically, morally good research look like? What constitutes the good life is an ancient and still debated question, predominantly associated with Aristotle and Aquinas. What constitutes good research is a far more contemporary one. And it is this question that underpins this lecture. How should we conduct research with human participants? What is the current state of play? How did we get to this point? And how should we engage with the ethics of research with human participants in the future? These are the questions that shape the arguments I will be making this evening. Now, at this point, I'm going to take some temporal liberties with the publicised title. What you can see here is that this rather beautiful image on the slide is of the Roman god Janus. Janus, this image is referred to as a Janus face, was the god of doorways. He could look both backwards and forwards simultaneously. Just as when we stand in a doorway, we can see both where we've come from and where we are going. So my series of arguments starts from standing in the doorway that represents contemporary research ethics. I'm going to outline where we currently are before looking back to the antecedents of current practice and then look forward to see what the future might hold. A research ethics journey which will be informed by the normative ethics approaches of utilitarianism, principalism, deontology and virtue. 
The defining characteristics of contemporary research ethics practice are legislation and governance. If ethics is concerned with doing the right thing, governance is concerned with doing the right thing in the right way. And for the last 60 or so years, the right way has been through the development of and compliance with codes of research ethics. The process of codification lies at the heart of how research with human participants is conducted. Government bodies, such as the UK Research Innovation and their subsidiary funding councils, the MRC, the ESRC, AHRC, etc. Major charitable research funders such as the Wellcome Trust, Leverhulme Foundation and the British Academy, charities such as Macmillan and Cancer Research UK, all have their codes of research ethics which beneficiaries have to conform with as a condition of funding. Legislation also plays its part. For example, the Mental Capacity Act in two th of 2005 requires researchers to consider the issue of consent to research with participants who have impaired cognitive function. The Human Tissue Act of 2006 and government organisations such as the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority <coughs> dictate what is permissible when seeking and conducting research with donations of human tissues and organs. Recently, we've all been aware of the advent of the General Data Protection Regulations 2008. GDPR has added a further level of regulation to the collection, storage and sharing of the personal and sensitive data likely to be sought in research. Whilst conducting research with NHS patients is regulated by the Health Regulation Authority and NHS R&D Permissions Authorities in NHS Trusts. Most professional and regulatory bodies, such as the Law Society, Royal College of Nursing and the British Psychological Society, provide guidance to members regarding the conduct of research in their disciplines. Within the UK university sector, institutional research ethics committees and regulations are the norm, and many universities are signatories to the UK Research Integrity Office and its Concordat to support research integrity published in 2012 and due for review soon, whose guidance provides an umbrella under which research ethics processes in universities can sit. Whilst much of what currently happens in UK universities sits outside of statutory legislative frameworks, there is an increasing emphasis on the need to conduct research with integrity. And very recently, earlier this year, the House of Commons Science and Technology Committee inquiry and report on research integrity published in June clearly identified a gap in the UK research integrity system to provide a means to investigate misconduct and to improve confidence in the existing system of self-regulation. And for a variety of reasons, it is in the interest of all stakeholders that research is conducted ethically and honestly. Public and charitable money supports research, evidence underpins political decisions and policy making, and public trust in experts can be undermined by poorly conducted research outcomes and scandals. But these are all very public consequences of research misconduct. And whilst the majority of researchers act with integrity, currently we do not know how many do not. And those who do act without integrity undermine confidence in the systems and processes of research that have done so much to enhance and improve human experience. But although these negative outcomes have the potential to impact on all of us to an extent, I would also argue that unethical conduct in research without integrity has a particular impact on the individual and their sense of self-identity as a researcher. I suggest that it is the rare individual who deliberately sets out on their research career with a deliberate intention to deceive or harm. Naivety, a lack of disciplinary engagement and circumstances such as the so-called publish or perish environment can compel researchers to engage in an, in an ethical practice. Arrogance can also play a part, a sense of one's research being so important that ethical considerations can be ignored, a somewhat the ends justify the means approach. And it's not just individuals that can be found wanting. The history of research ethics 
is littered with examples of what we now consider to be gross misconduct by organisations. Very recent scandals, such as the, um, as you may recall, the Cambridge Analytica Facebook data mining breaches in March 2018, clearly point to the wide-reaching impact of new technologies if used unethically. And the recognition of the phenomenon of ethics dumping, where high-income countries undertake research in middle, low-income countries without the active involvement of highly vulnerable populations, has led the EU to develop a global code of conduct for research in resource poor settings. Adherence to this code, launched earlier in the year, is mandatory throughout all the stages of a, of a research project for funding streams such as Horizon 2020 and those initiatives that will follow it. So far, I've touched upon the current research ethics and integrity environment, painting a picture which is dominated by a view of research being a good thing, but with the potential not to be conducted in a good way. The desire to push forward the boundaries of knowledge, a worthy objective, is fundamentally flawed if the individuals involved, whether researcher or participants, are damaged in the process. The universal solution to promote ethical research practice whilst minimising harm and maximising benefits, is considered to be through governance. Research ethics and integrity are situated in a frame of regulation, predominantly of codes and committees, and yet research malpractice and unethical behaviour still happen, a phenomenon that raises further questions. Firstly, how did we reach the current state where the code dominates the research ethics scene? Secondly, if unethical research behaviour is still apparent, are codes of any value? And finally, is there another way to tackle the issue of how to develop ethically literate researchers and deliver good research? To answer these questions, we need to turn our attention to the past and the emergence of formal research with human participants. The earliest researchers with human beings would not really have considered themselves as such. Barber surgeons and physicians sought to understand ill health and injury in the hope of relieving suffering and developing their knowledge through the observation of cause and effect relationships. Essentially, they were engaged with the development of practice through trial and error. For example, trepanning has been used since Neolithic times, and the skeletal remains, such as these found in Chios in Greece, bear witness to the actions of the ancients who sought to relieve raised intracranial pressure through the release of demons or fluids through the cranium. Ancient Greek philosophers adopted observation and deduction to develop systems of knowledge, and physicians, such as Hippocrates, sought to systematise medical teaching with his famous oath of first do no harm, which, although now contested in some areas in medicine, continues to feature as a principle in bioethics codes. Individual horror stories of medical interventions, such as that experienced by diarist Samuel Pepys in 1658, when he had a bladder stone removed without anaesthetic through an incision in his perineum, the work of battleship and uh, field and battleship surgeons in dealing with post-operative shock and infection following amputation, and the re-emergence of ancient methods of wound cleansing or debridement through the application of sugar, or, and if, um, there's a health warning now, if you're squeamish, look away now, that, of, I thought that would wake you up, right. Um, through the application of sugar or medical grade maggots, all point to the role that naive trial and error approaches have, still have on clinical practice. And also, um, we use leeches now in medical practice to relieve pressure from hematoma as well. But these practices were not research as we now recognise it. To understand the history of modern research with human participants, we need to turn to the explosion of science arising from the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, the development of the research Humboldtian University and the emergence of empiricism as the dominant paradigm informing the quest for knowledge. John Locke's empiricism, 
the philosophical position that posits veri verifiable experience as the basis of knowledge is closely tied to the scientific methods adopted from the 17th century onwards. Originally associated with the natural sciences, the role of experimentation gradually became incorporated into the study of human behaviour. Early psychological experiments on memory, cognition and the physiological manifestations of emotion emerged in the late 1800s, with the establishment of the first psychology laboratory by Wilhelm Wundt at Leipzig University in 1879. And here we can see Wundt and some of his learned colleagues um, looking at some early um, equipment that they used for exactly these, this purpose. Introspection which we might think of as an early manifestation of mindfulness, enabled researchers to understand the internal mental processes of thought through an objective process. Now, whether any ethical considerations featured is debatable, but what we do know is that from psychology and medicine, and particularly medical and psychological research that we would now consider exploitative, that modern human participant research ethics has arisen within the context of a far greater awareness of the potential and actual harm that can result from research aimed at developing new knowledge. It is often the scandals in society that act as a catalyst for change, and I've been very intrigued by a book recently published by Dr Sam Cooley, a sports psychologist at the University of Birmingham. And he published this book on uh, the strange and very alarming experiments that have influenced the development of modern research ethics practices. So I have a few of them for you, which I thought you might find interesting. In his book, The Museum of Bizarre and Extreme Science, a collection of the most outlandish experiments in history, Dr. Cooley provides examples of studies that, from a contemporary perspective, flout key aspects of current research ethics practice. For example, the need to minimise harm to the participants would no doubt have been breached in a study seeking to study facial expressions through the observation of how participants reacted to watching the decapitation of live rats. Avoiding harm to the researcher is at odds with the actions of the researcher who in the mid-1880s injected himself with the mashed up testicles of dogs and guinea pigs to improve his health. And finally, all psychology students are aware of the Little Albert experiment, in which Watson and Rayner in 1920 conditioned a baby, a nine-month-old baby called Little Albert, to fear fluffy objects through pairing the appearance of a toy rabbit with a loud and frightening noise. And I'm very grateful to Katie for finding a seasonal example here because they even paired fear with Father Christmas. And do I have to admit that mask is pretty scary, so I don't blame little Albert. It was unremarkable in 1920, but definitely not acceptable today because the price paid by little Albert in terms of psychological harm would be considered too great despite the knowledge about the origins of phobias that was developed. What these examples demonstrate is that the development of research ethics cannot be divorced from the sociocultural and political environments in which such work is conducted. Social mores change, and if social attitudes and behaviours considered acceptable even in the last decade are now being questioned, how more so are the events of the more distant past? In research ethics, some research scandals stand out as the game changers. The events that influence the way in which we conduct research with human participants irrevocably, the legacy of which shape our practice today. And it is to these that we now turn our attention. On June 2nd, 1948, seven Nazi doctors were hung at Landsberg Prison in Bavaria. First amongst them was Professor Karl Gebhardt, chief surgeon to the SS, who held the rank of Major General and was president of the German Red Cross. In total, 20 doctors were tried in the International Tribunal at Nuremberg. Charges included medical experimentation without consent of prisoners of war, on members of occupied countries and vulnerable individuals with mental illness or learning disabilities surgical experimentation and the infliction of battlefield injuries to further the development of reconstructive surgery or without anaesthetic were common. But the mass murders in Ravensbrück and Auschwitz 
were in many ways the culmination of the previous years of exploitation under doctors such as Mengele and Karl Klauberg, who conducted X-ray sterilisation experiments on Jewish and Roma women and the legalised sterilisation and involuntary euthanasia of children with Down syndrome. According to Ernst in 2001, the betrayal of Hippocrates in Nazi medicine featured throughout the 1930s but it was only at the end of World War II that the true extent was revealed. Now, the doctors in the trials used the defence that there were no clear international standards for the conduct of scientific research with human beings. And furthermore, some of the prisoners were already sentenced to death. In their view, experimentation would make no material difference to their long-term survival. But these arguments held no sway when held against the standards any civilised human being would recognise or expect. What emerged from the doctor's trial, and was further reinforced by similar revelations and war crimes committed by Japanese doctors on prisoners of war and in occupied areas of China, was the Nuremberg Code, 1949, that places informed voluntary consent at the heart of any research study with human participants. The Code and the Declaration of Helsinki, adopted in 1964 by the World Medical Assembly, set out the principles on which all subsequent codes have been developed. But whilst both documents clearly reflected the reaction and horror felt by countries with respect to the war crimes con conducted in the name of research, it is another infamous study that has really led to the development of research ethics governments as we now know it today. On the 16th of May, 1997, President Bill Clinton issued a formal apology from the American people to the survivors of a 40-year-long medical research experiment, the infamous Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male, which became synonymous with the exploitation of African Americans. This investigation of the trajectory of untreated syphilis was a longitudinal study that flouted many of the principles of Nuremberg and Helsinki. It exposed men and their families to high levels of risk, as the progression of this life-limiting disease was monitored over many years. And at no time were the men given treatment, even when effective medication had been available for decades. Tuskegee stands out as an example of systematic exploitation of vulnerable participants, and it was only halted in 1972. And although eventually, court settlements of around $50,000 per participant were made, over 100 men died painful and degrading deaths. In Europe, another highly influential study that changed biomedical research was the thalidomide scandal of the 1960s, where pregnant women experiencing nausea and vomiting in early pregnancy were offered the drug without knowing they were part of a trial. The birth of children without limbs and with sensory impairments has greatly influenced the conduct of drug trials and has led to the stringent safeguards we now work within surrounding the possible, possible impact of drugs on eggs and sperm. What scandals such as Tuskegee provided was the catalyst for the development of the Belmont Report, an American report that identified three main principles that should underpin all research conducted with human participants. In 1979, the bioethicist Beecham and Childress expanded Belmont's three principles of respect, beneficence and justice into what has now become known as the Georgetown mantra of autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence and justice. These four principles draw on Kant's categorical imperative of treating human beings only in a way that you yourself would wish to be treated, in other words, respect, utilitarianism and its balance of harms, maleficence and benefits, non-maleficence, and justice, based on John Rawls' work, all underpin contemporary research ethics practice. What also developed was the emergence in the USA of institutional review boards and in, in the UK, the development of research ethics committees in universities, and particularly in the NHS from 1991. It is fair to say that considerations of ethics when conducting research with human participants has developed very considerably since the 1970s. 
Famous psychology experiments, which have generated ongoing discussion, have included Stanley Milgram's obedience to authority studies in 1961, and also Philip Zimbardo Stanford experiments in 1971 on the impact of roles and conformity on behaviour. In both studies, ethically difficult situations were used to generate new understanding of human behaviour, and whilst contested, interpretation and reinterpretation of the running of the studies and the findings continued to challenge and intrigue. And for those of you who are interested in following up the ethics aspect of Milgram and Simbardo, I would recommend uh, Riker and Haslam. They have some particularly interesting takes on the ethics of the work. So what then can the history of research ethics tell us? We've seen the emergence of principalism, the role of normative ethics and considerations of utility and consequence. And we've seen how codes have been developed to provide guidance and governance to researchers. Progress has undoubtedly been made. But have codes and committees really delivered? And if not, what is the solution? It is to these questions that I wish to return. Earlier on, I outlined current practice in the NHS and in universities, research councils, funding bodies and charities. All have their codes, and all of those codes have at their core Nuremberg, Helsinki, Belmont and the Beecham and Childress principles. All research should, in theory, know what they can do and cannot do with respect to conducting research with human participants. Follow the codes, complete the ethics review process and all will be well. However, once again, scandals tell us that this is far from the case. To quote Hughes in Macfarlane 2009, conformity to a code of ethics is no guarantor of ethical practice. Now, some of you may well recall the Bristol Royal Infirmary and the Royal Liverpool Children's Hospital at Alderhey scandals in the 1990s. It's because of these that we now have the Human Tissue Act and the um, Human Tissue Authority. And both attest to the fact that the existence of research ethics codes does not mean unethical practices do not happen. But what such scandals do lead to is tighter control and also a degree of mission creep where ethical frameworks developed for biomedical and psychological research are now applied across all disciplines with varying degrees of acceptance and validity. Now, universities are rightly concerned with reputational damage and loss of funding if they are found wanting. And the introduction of the GDPR regulations in May, May 2018 has resulted in a far greater concern because of the implications of very substantial fines for breaches. Yet despite all this governance, are we in danger of missing the essentials that should underpin human interactions? Questions of how we should live our lives and how we should interact with each other. And I do wonder whether by forcing our students and researchers into ever tighter and smaller governance boxes, do we do research ethics a disservice as the research ethics committee becomes increasingly seen not as a facilitator of research conducted ethically, but rather as a cul-de-sac down which good ideas are lured and quietly strangled. Does the student who equates having received the green light to proceed as having done my ethics? And does the favourable ethics opinion letter providing that green light run the risk of becoming a certificate of comfort, enabling the recipient to suspend further engagement with the ethics of their work? Now, my commitment to the ethics of research remains undimmed, but my fear is that whilst how we currently practice research ethics governments may be necessary to provide a common ground of guidance we can share, it is not sufficient to develop the real and authentic sense of ethical awareness essential in the next generation of researchers and for future research. At a time when technology is moving so fast, and globalisation and internationalisation is ever increasing, can codes really evolve fast enough to keep up? And are those codes so rooted in Western ethics, philosophy and practices that they lack relevance and credibility for many individuals we seek to work with? It is to these limitations and a possible way forward that I will now turn. In 
In suggesting a way forward for research ethics and integrity, I'm going to return to one of the most ancient normative ethics approaches that seeks to answer the question of what is the good life? According to Aristotle and Plato, and also appearing in Confucian and Christian thought, the good life is a virtuous life. And it is only through living a life of virtue that we can find happiness or eudaimonia. So what do we mean by virtue and how does this apply to research ethics? Macfarlane quotes Rochelle's 1999 stating that a virtue is a trait of character manifested in habitual action that is good for a person to have. Virtue is about character. Virtues represent the median point, the middle point, between extremes or vices of common human behaviours. Virtues can be manifest either through deficiencies or excesses. For example, the virtue of courage sits in the middle of a deficiency cowardice and an excess recklessness. Macfarlane adopts a virtue approach and applies it to the research journey or cycle, clearly identifying how virtue and vice can map onto the different stages of the process. We can see that in taking a virtue approach, responsibility is placed on the researcher to develop the excellence of character that codes expect, and doing so in a way fulfilling the requirement that research should be conducted with integrity. In other words, researchers are supported to integrate the different elements of their true selves, mentally, physically, intellectually and so socially, through engaging in reflective practice throughout the research cycle. However, self-reflection and basing research practice within a virtue framework is not solely reliant on the researcher. It also <coughs> requires a virtuous education process where universities provide an environment where doing the right thing is explicitly incorporated into governance and curricula, and where educators and supervisors model those traits of character manifested in habitual action that is good for a person to have. And I thought I'd give you an illustration of this. Um, this is an example of a way that that might be achieved. It's the British Psychological uh, Society guidelines on teaching ethics competencies that I launched in May 2015. And through this, we support academic psychologists in their teaching of ethics, because I've long believed it's no good telling somebody what to do unless you actually provide them with the tools to do it. Seen through a virtue lens, researching with integrity is not just about compliance with a code as a necessary hoop to jump through. It is rather an educational opportunity to develop characteristics that will enable the researcher to engage with ethical thinking and action throughout a research career and during the development and delivery of any specific research project. Like Macfarlane, I would argue that virtue ethics can go a long way to overcome the say-do gap in research where individuals comply with ethics codes but then flout the ethics principles they've agreed to abide by. It is this type of educative approach that the Compostela group of 68 leading Euro European universities was seeking to support through the development of the Poznan Declaration launched in September 2014 and reported in the University World News. Although aimed at identifying how the incorporation of a virtue ethics approach can develop ethical awareness in graduates and promote rejection of state and corporate corruption, I suggest that the principles of Poznan also apply to the teaching of research methods and research ethics. And I would further argue that in developing ethical awareness in our graduates and modelling ethical awareness in our practice as educators, we continue to support and promote the fundamental educational aims of developing the next generations of socially and ethically aware citizens. And to quote Martin, Martin Luther King, intelligence plus character, that's the goal of true education. So to recap, we have seen where we are in terms of codes and governance, and we've examined how we have arrived at this point, often in reaction to scandals. And I have suggested that codes have their limitations and that virtue may be a possible way to overcome the say-do gap still evident in current practice. So in supporting that suggestion and argument, I'm going to use two examples, firstly from technology and secondly, which I've previously referred to, engagement with research in middle, low-income countries. 
And the two virtues I'll consider are courage and respectfulness. So the vices associated with courage are either the deficit of cowardice or an excess leading to recklessness. In their 2011 paper, Brostrom and Yudgowski considered how the development of artificial intelligence, AI, has both the potential to greatly enhance human life or to destroy it. What is required in the advancement of AI is not just the development of the algorithms for breathtakingly fast and effective decision-making superior to human capability, but the development of a machine ethics that is also human superior in its ethics capabilities. For those who develop such systems, considerations of virtue and vice are essential. Being overly fearful could result in the loss of opportunities to address human problems such as climate change and increasing food production. Being reckless could result in the development of systems causing irrevocable harm through increased inequalities or damage to human and natural existence. The ability to recognise and incorporate an ethical mindset into the development of AI is essential to both maximise potential and minimising harm. And interestingly, I received this paper only last week by Dr Ian Brown on exactly this issue. And it's currently a piece of work that's been investigated in the Commons um, Science and Technology Committee. And this paper is entitled Artificial Intelligence, the Science of Practical Ethics. It's a very good read, I recommend it. The second virtue I want to consider has been key to research ethics since the first Nuremberg Code. Respectfulness should sit at the heart of ethics relationships with participants. Informed consent is the most frequently cited manifestation of it. It was respectfulness that was singularly lacking in the Tuskegee scandal, where participants were deliberately exploited in a highly manipulative manner because of their educational disadvantages and their lack of socio-economic capital. Respectfulness is an essential component of work in sensitive areas. Much of the work that we do here in Brighton is in just these areas. Disclosures of personal experience of HIV, HIV AIDS, suicide, sexual abuse, or in my own area of research expertise, male urogenital cancer, are dependent on rapport and the avoidance of researcher participant relationships that could potentially exploit participants and their vulnerability. From a global perspective, conducting research in a disrespectful manner also runs the risk of exploiting Indigenous First Nation peoples both in terms of their knowledge and in terms of their environments. Now, I previously referred to the EU Global Code of Conduct for Research in Resource-Poor Settings, which was developed in partnership with Indigenous populations, such as the South African San people. And in New Zealand, the Treaty of Waitangi, dating back to the 19th century and protected of the rights and lands of the Maori peoples, is incorporated into research codes of practice. A particularly lyrical example, and there's a really nice rap on the web website if you want to take a look at it, is the Code of Research Ethics produced by the Trust Global Code of Conduct, which requires researchers to work with the collectivist cultural traditions of the SAM, a group that has been greatly exploited for many years. By working respectfully in a global research environment is not just about the avoidance of manipulation and exploitation and the partiality of one group over another. It is also about considering the differing ethical and philosophical positions of those we seek to work with. We need to avoid the imposition of ethical imperialism through the application of codes of ethics predicated on the autonomy of the individual to act in their own best interests rather than the authority of the community to make decisions about what is in the best interest of the group. And I would argue that a virtue ethics approach takes us some way to developing approaches that embrace and work with these differing cultural perspectives. So some final thoughts. At the start of this lecture, I said I was going to outline where we currently are before looking back to the antecedents of current practice and then looking forward to see what the future might hold. And in the last 40 minutes or so, we have been on an accelerated research ethics journey, during which we've touched on the normative ethics approaches of utilitarianism, principalism, deontology and virtue. 
I've put forward a series of arguments and counter-arguments for the utility and limitations of research ethics codes. And I've outlined the dominant role of research ethics governance, which I do not see disappearing anytime soon. Research ethics committees are with us to stay. And at this point, I want to play tribute to my wonderful colleagues who work in the research ethics community within this university. They do a fabulous job and I'm very, very proud to work with them. The need for X um, is illustrated very, uh, very recently by two high profile examples. We've all read about Matthew Hedges, the Durham University PhD student recently imprisoned and now thankfully released in the um, UAE. And we've also been aware of the controversies of the use of a um, gene editing process called CRISPR at Shenzhen University in China. And both these examples clearly demonstrate the need for robust and effective research review process, processes to protect both the researcher and the researched. Finally, I've considered the role of virtue and I have suggested that this ancient approach holds contemporary value in a fast changing research world. In some ways and arguably the most challenging of all the normative ethics approaches, I honestly believe that it is in supporting and encouraging the development of virtuous researchers and virtuous ethical practices that the most ethical research advances will be made. So, Having planted that thought in your minds, I'm going to close. But I am going to leave the final word to the San people of South Africa, who in their research ethics code say, Andre Steenkamp, the respected San leader who contributed to this code of ethics until he passed away in 2016, asked researchers to come through the door, not the window. The door stands for the SAN processes, and when researchers respect the door, the SAN can have research that is positive for us. Thank you for your attention, and good night. <laughs>